Welcome to this part of the Core 12 Seal 2023-2025 Requirements video series. I'm Pascal Floor of DANS, the Dutch Expertise Center and Repository for Research Data. In this series, we talk you through the new Core 12 Seal requirements, and you will learn about the details of each requirement, the evidence expected from applicants, extended guidances, and the changes compared to the previous version of the requirements. This video covers requirement number zero, or the background information and context. It gives a summary and highlights the most important aspects, but please do refer to the full guidelines and extended guidelines for the complete text and guidances. If you have not already done so, I also recommend that you watch the general introduction video to this series first. This gives a general guidance on to how an application should be filled in. Before addressing the 16 actual requirements, it is necessary for applicants to give background and context information about their repository. This is essential for a reviewer to understand what sort of repository is being dealt with in order to correctly assess if the requirements have been met. The section is not meant to repeat anything which will be written when addressing the requirements, rather to give a background and a context and to supply a space where relevant issues not addressed under the requirements can be mentioned. This is a short introduction only. Uh, for additional information, I can recommend, um, except for the actual written guidelines, of course, the video by Jonathan Crabtree, especially the last 10 minutes. The first part is the R3 identifier. Uh, this speaks for itself, really. Uh, it's assumed the repository is listed on the R3 data archive site, so which you see the address here, and uh, it is asked to fill in the identifier. Uh, what is meant here is the identifier of the repository, not of the organization in general, so of the applicant, right? Not of the general organization it may fall under. Although it's of course not a problem to give this as well. Uh, the identifier um, is the DOI listed here in this example. You can see this at the bottom of the page here. There's also an alternative R3 identifier, which it's uh, of course fine to give as well, as long as the DOI is also given. The second part is about the repository type, and this is a change from before in the sense that it is now asked to select between a generalist or a specialist repository, and in the case uh, of a specialist repository to provide the domain and the disciplines that are covered in, in a free text form. Um, a specialist repository is a domain or subject-based repository which specializes in a specific research field or data type and supports that defined designated community. In contrast, uh, a generalist repository does not specialize in a domain, discipline, specific research field or data type. And it's important to realize here that it's about the specialization of the repository, not of the depositors. So if a generalist repository with general metadata schemes and so on happens to have a lot of, say, social sciences or humanities data sets, this does not make them a social science or humanities or specialist repository instead they're still a generalist repository. Um, but for example, if a repository takes only climate data sets, then it would be a specialist repository. The third part is an overview of the repository. Um, so these are key characteristics like the scope and size of data collections, the data types and formats, and this should reflect the selected repository type. If you're already familiar with the core trust seal requirements from before, there are no large changes here. The only thing is that other relevant information is now included here. So uh, the overview can include contextual information that is not covered elsewhere in the requirements. An example is that the repository can give a brief summary of their organization, the various data services offered, how many data sets are present, and for example, what they mean with data set. Uh, the supplied evidence are entries on their website in this example. So, for example, in the, uh, in the About section. The fourth part is the designated community. Um, here, um, it's good to give a clear definition of the designated community to demonstrate that uh, the applicant to the repository understands the scope, knowledge base and methodologies of the target group of users, including, for example, software and formats. Um, it's good to give a specific definition and description of each of the designated communities and sub-communities 
including uh, the composition, so how homogeneous is the group, um, what are the skills of the, of the target group of users, so what are the research methods, what languages or language do they speak, and what software is being used, um, what are their needs, um, what sort of infrastructure, what sort of access do they require, what sort of file formats do they use, and what are typical reuse scenarios. So there's obviously a clear difference if uh, the user group really requires only to read uh, files or if they actually want to download them and use them for statistical analysis. Um, it is possible to have different sub-communities and in this case, the specific des description is needed for each of those. An example of a designated community could be the immunological research community. And this could be the case even though a repository's data sets could also be of interest for other medical users like medical researchers and others. So this highlights that the designated community can be smaller than the overall group of consumers of the repository data metadata and services. The fifth part asks to specify the levels of curation present in the repository. So there are four levels. Um, A is content distributed as deposited. B is basic curation, for example, a brief checking, uh, maybe an addition of basic metadata or documentation. Uh, C is enhanced curation. For example, the conversion to new formats during ingest, enhancement of documentation and metadata and things like that. And then D is data level curation. So that is like C, but with additional editing of the deposited data. Um, it is possible to have different levels within one repository, um, for example, for different digital objects or different depositors. Uh, this needs to be clearly defined in the application and also in which proportion these are being done. Uh, and in principle, the uh, repository can have any of these, but of course it is important in order to gain the core trust seal that a repository assures long-term accessibility and understandability of the data um, as the needs of the designated community may change. And this might be unlikely at levels A or B, because there's no common preservation format and a lack of rich metadata, for example. Um, by the way, all levels assume that initial deposits are retained unchanged as well, uh, that metadata is present at deposit, and that ongoing measures for active preservation are in place. There is a discussion paper about these levels, uh, which you can find by going through this, to this link. These are examples of what sort of levels that might be present in a repository. Uh, in this example, repository D converts data to the relevant data model and also incorporates extra metadata, so that would be curation level D. Uh, another repository might offer multiple levels of curation depending on specific agreements with depositors. The sixth part covers cooperation and outsourcing to third parties, partners and host organizations. This can be left blank if the applicant is entirely responsible for all decisions and takes all relevant actions related to meeting requirements 1 to 16. If, however, for one or more requirements, the applicant is supported by another organization um, in making decisions or in taking actions, that organization, the role it plays and its relationship with the applicant should be listed here. Um, so also if any function and or supporting evidence is not under the control of the applicant. Uh, contracts and agreements should be used as evidence, although if it is a sensitive information or commercial information, this does not necessarily need to be included, uh, but it should be specified what, what is covered. Um, if there's more than one partner, it can be useful to have a context diagram. So it should be specified about each organization, what its role is, what function, what service does it provide, what is the relationship and agreement with the applicant, and does it have certifications itself. Uh, what is important is that the applicant must retain responsibility for the preservation planning and actions undertaken to data and metadata to ensure they remain usable by the desig designated community for the long term. So that's something that should not be outsourced. 
Um, some examples could be that a repository uses the premises, the HR and IT support from another larger organization. Or a repository might use hosting services from another organization for its backend system. The seventh part of requirement zero or the background and context is only for existing applicants. So those that are renewing their core trust seal certification. Um, this is a summary of significant changes since the last application. And this is because there is an expectation of continuous improvement over time. Uh, here, repository should highlight any significant changes, including to technical systems, designated community, or funding during the three previous years. Uh, this can also include and should include any steps taken to move from in progress to implemented. Uh, it's important to realize that this is not meant for changes since the last review, but only for changes since the last certification. This concludes the instruction on the background and context of the new core trust seal requirements. Uh, similar instruction videos can be found on all the other requirements and they can be found on the Core Trust Seal YouTube channel. You can find the full set of new requirements for the period 2023 to 25 on the Core Trust Seal website. If you have any remaining questions or would like more information, please contact Core Trust Seal using the email address shown here.